Great is the Lord, he is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord, great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, I lift up my voice. I lift up my voice. Great are you, Lord. Let's bow our, bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us, Lord. Thank you for the encouragement that we can receive from one another here in your, your house as we worship you. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with us this morning. I pray that all that we say and do would honor and glorify you. In your name we pray, amen. amen. All right, please be seated. All right, good morning. good morning. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're glad to be in church this morning. I hope you're looking forward to hearing from the Lord uh, today. All right, we just got a few announcements before we get going. Um, first of all, I'd like to mention that we have um, missionaries visiting with us, Brother Missionary Croker and his wife Brenda, and their children are here with us today. He'll be teaching in the main Sunday school this morning, and then also I will be preaching in the main service, and then back at 1 p.m., 1 p.m., we're going to have an afternoon service here, and he'll be preaching to us at 1 p.m. this afternoon. So we'll have the Sunday school, Sunday morning, and the afternoon service today. So we're looking forward to that. I always look forward to when the Lord brings missionaries. Um, the Croakers are going to the land of Bolivia, and they're going to try to reach the Mennonite people, the settlers, the Mennonite settlers in Bolivia, but also going to try to reach the Spanish people. How many understand that we're to reach everybody? How many say amen to that? Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. We need to reach everybody. And so that's exciting to uh, have missionaries with us this morning. Okay. Also, uh, August 15 through 19, we'll be having Vacation Bible School. The heroes in Haiti. The heroes in the island of Haiti. And we've been passing out lots of flyers if you need some. We have some if you'd like to invite some more kids and things. We have lots of flyers to give out. And uh, looking forward to doing that. So um, let's see. Also, this after the morning service, we have a baptism. Uh, Claire, Clara Peters is going to be getting baptized after the morning service. So looking forward to that. That will be exciting to be a part of. Okay, also, ladies' Bible study at 7 p.m. Tuesday night. Tuesday night, 7 p.m. Right here, we'll have ladies' Bible study. And uh, we we'll look forward to that. i uh, just like to say happy birthday to Laura Huff. August 10th, Georgia Dare. Happy birthday. You look good for 50, August 10th, August 11th, and Linda Stewart's birthday. Linda's not here this morning, so August 13th will be Linda's birthday. Anthony and Bethany Monkman are celebrating their anniversary August 10th. They're out west. You make sure you let them know uh, that you uh, congratulate those folks for their birthday and congratulate those with their anniversary. All right, Jason, if you'd like to come we'll, and lead a song and bring the pretty blonde with you too, I guess. <laughs> I got a helper. I need all the yeah, help I can get, man. so that's, that's good. Right. Let's stand one more time. We're going to get our exercise in. We're going to stand one more time and sing More Precious Than Silver. Yeah. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are 
more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I desire compares to you. Lord, your name is higher than the mountains. Lord, your love is deeper than the sea. Lord, your love encompasses the nations, and yet you live right here inside of me. Who can weigh the value of knowing you? Who can judge the worth of who you are? Who can count the blessings of loving you? And who can say just how great you are? Amen. Please be seated. Amen. Great singing this morning. Yes, that was great stuff. All right, I'm going to ask Brother John Croker to come at this time. And I'd like him to come and teach us in Sunday school and share his burden a bit. And also this afternoon, preach to us. There's a difference between teaching and preaching. I hope that you'll also share your testimony either yeah. now or in the second service. We'd love to hear how the Lord worked in your life. How many yeah. think if you're going to go halfway around the world, tell people about Jesus, you ought to know Jesus. <laughs> and you ought to be able to rehearse how Jesus saved you. And we'd like to hear about your yeah. call. All Thank right, you. also. All right, brother, would you come? God bless you. Thank, Thank you for being with us. Let's welcome Brother Croker this morning to church. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for the privilege and the opportunity to share our ministry with you folks. And uh, uh, my testimony, well, first of all, I'll just introduce me and then John Croker and then my wife Brenda. Of course, the children are scattered abroad right now. We have Renee, Leanne, Shane, Avery and then little Ember and so uh, God has blessed us with five children we're excited about that you know I say <laughs> with the Mennonite people they usually have large families so we're about halfway there and so <laughs> we're getting there <laughs> you know nowadays you have one or two and they think you have a large family so I grew up in uh, southern Ontario I grew up in the Mennonite religious system old colony Mennonite you know the term Mennonite is very broad and so, you know, some folks would say, well, why are you reaching the Mennonites? Aren't they just like us, you know? And so I have to qualify who these Mennonites are. And specifically, these are the old colony Mennonites. Uh, my uh, four, is it three generations are from Mexico. And so I was born in Mexico, probably the biggest Mexican you've ever seen. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> we're not of the Mexican people where it's just the Mennonites settled there. <coughs> and so that goes back into the 1920s. And so our people group originally came from northern Germany and then the Netherlands, uh, Friesland area. And, and then were, uh, uh, they migrated to uh, what is present day um, Ukraine, which was Prussia then, uh, close to the Black Sea. There was Malacha and Gordica colony. And so that's where the old colonies came from. And then they migrated in the late 1800s to uh, mostly Winkler, Manitoba some to BC and some to uh, Saskatchewan and so on. And then in the 1920s, a lot of them went to uh, Chihuahua, Mexico and some to Durango, Mexico. Those uh, that were from uh, Saskatchewan, a lot went to Durango, Mexico. And that's where I was born. That's where my parents were born and grandpa was born. Uh, four generations uh, uh, back would have been uh, Saskatchewan and then five generations would have been back in uh, Ukraine, our present-day Ukraine, and so uh, that's the, the people group that we're reaching, and their uh, works-based salvation, and so um, my parents uh, came from Mexico to uh, southern Ontario, that's where I grew up, and, uh, but they never j uh, joined a church because they didn't want to be uh, excommunicated from the Mennonite church they were from in Mexico, and so I didn't grow up going to church at all <coughs> until I was 11, 12 years old, First time I went to church, and uh, but never heard a true, uh, a clear plan of salvation. Uh, me and two friends, when I was 19, we moved to Alberta, and I got a job in power line construction. And through that, 
uh, received a gospel tract. My boss, he gave me a gospel tract. And, uh, and even before uh, leaving home, as a lost person, I told myself, uh, I'm not leaving home unless I get a Bible. And uh, two days before I left home, I, my dad bought me a Bible and gave me a Bible. It's just unheard of to have a Bible as a young Mennonite or youth, and, you know, and, and as a lost person praying this, or I don't even know praying, but just telling myself I'm not leaving home and didn't even know why. Just thought, well, I need some kind of guidance if I'm going to leave home, but I never touched my Bible uh, when I left. And so, but God was doing a work right from when I left. Uh, my boss gave me a gospel tract. I read the gospel tract over and over. Uh, it didn't make sense. I thought it's, that's too easy. That's just so simple. I p- put it away. And then uh, three, three months later, I, mo- I was transferred with the same company to uh, Yellowknife Northwest Territories. And uh, uh, the night I moved uh, there, my roommate shared his testimony and, and the gospel with me. I don't know if you just heard recently of a drowning in Uranium City, Saskatchewan, Andreas Weeb. Uh, that was the gentleman in Yellowknife then that led me to the Lord. And, uh, and right there in that uh, living room there, uh, God pricked my heart and said, John, that's enough. You're trusting in yourself. And uh, I repented of trusting in myself and trusted in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior as he shared his testimony and how powerful a testimony is because within that is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and how he was trusting only in that. And my heart's cry was, God, if you can save him, you can save me. And for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And so uh, this, here I was, 19 years old, just got saved. Uh, this was on a Monday. Started going to church uh, uh, that Wednesday. And uh, shortly thereafter, we receive a prayer letter from uh, Will Clausen in Mexico. And he shared about the great need to reach the Mennonite people. And he mentioned the very little village that I was born in and the Mennonites surrounding that area. And I was just so burdened, first of all, just being newly saved now for my own family and now also for my own people group. And that's where God really spurred my heart for missions and uh, not that he had called me then but just pointed me in that direction and uh, a very specific Sunday school you think Sunday school class called to missions and how my uh, pastor was teaching on Aquila and Priscilla and as a single person I thought man if I could just get married and give my life to help out somebody on a mission field uh, and uh, you have to remember I'm new to the Bible new to everything and just uh, hearing about this uh, couple serving the Lord and how I wanted to do that with my life. And uh, so uh, the pastor there in Yellowknife is Pastor Frank Siemens. He's originally from Winkler, Manitoba, and that's where my wife is from. And then so she went to uh, visit the pastor in Yellowknife, and that's where I met her. And then I moved down to Winkler, Manitoba. We got married and went to Bible college. And... uh, and then through other means, uh, reading the book of Acts, um, the counsel of Pastor Sullivan, and also um, the, the need shared by missionary Jake Weeb, uh, God really confirmed in my heart, and I pushed it for many years uh, because I wanted to go to my own people group in Mexico, but God confirmed my heart that he wanted us to go to Bolivia uh, to reach these, these dear folks with the gospel and... Uh, and just you, uh, just amazing how, you know, years ago, uh, my wife was able to uh, start a, a bus ministry in the, the church. It was just her picking up children uh, and then, you know, and then asking others to come early and uh, fill their car up and then even come earlier than, than normal and do a, a double trips with their cars to pick up children for um, for for master club on Wednesdays and also for church, and and so on. And then uh, it went from the car to a uh, uh, fifteen passenger van, and then from there to a bus. And now they're running two buses and a handy van. And but anyways, we didn't want to just reach the the, the children. We wanted to reach uh, the the parents. And so we went and visited all the parents of these children, not knowing then that God had called us to Bolivia 
and how all these uh, parents that we went to visit were uh, from Bolivia and how uh, they were uh, uh, kicked out of their colony, so to speak, and so they, they, they have to run for their life, so to speak, and uh, many come for refugee in uh, Winkler, Manitoba, uh, having some kind of connection from uh, uh, relatives and so on, and so we were able to communicate with these uh, people, and some of them, we were uh, on our survey trip, one family we were able to visit there, I was able to lead one of the boys to the Lord uh, during, I think it was VBS. And, uh, and so we were able to visit that family. They're still there. And so all the connections that we have been able to make have been amazing just because of uh, previous ministries and serving God where you are, just being faithful right there, right then at the moment, how God puts that all together. And so God has called us to reach these people with the gospel once again, they're, they're works-based salvation type people. Um, it's a baptismal regeneration, uh, saying you're, you're saved because of your baptism, and that's what they will refer to uh, as their salvation, is being uh, baptized. And so um, uh, there's, a, there's a great need and a very deep hunger there, especially amongst the youth uh, uh, in Bolivia, and so they'll do whatever it takes, you know, sneak out and get a radio or a phone, you know, not to, you know, play games on, but to hear the gospel because they're hungry and, uh, or uh, go to a Bible study. But uh, it's, uh, they face a lot of persecution there if they're found out. You know, I have pictures sent to my phone of some, uh, some young boys. They were found out that they went to a Bible study and what they do then the elder of the, uh, of the church there will make the, the father of the children uh, openly shame them and usually by way of whipping them. And so uh, these people, I know you think, well, you wouldn't think that would happen amongst these Mennonite people, but that's just the thing. Like the Pharisees, they have a great facade about them where uh, they can do a lot of these things, you know, behind the scenes and people wouldn't find out but that's what they do. And so these young people face a lot of fear uh, of, uh, you know, taking that step of faith and being saved and never mind the next step of, of being baptized. And so uh, uh, there, there's a great hunger there. And so that's what's exciting about this mission field is that there's a, a great hunger uh, for folks uh, and they, they want to be saved. <coughs> Just by way of a lesson here, You can take your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Or sorry, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. We'll get to the passage yet and this morning's lesson is teaching on a motivation and how, you know, this is a deep topic. You go onto any kind of social media these days, there's all sorts of self-help and motivational speaking and, you know, getting you stirred up and, and, how, to, uh, and uh, how to start your day and so on and to get going and to be motivated and, uh, <coughs> and so, but we're going to look at scriptural motivation. And really, this was a personal study for me. And I, count, I, I entitled it Motive in Missions. Why am I doing what I am doing? Uh, but you can apply this to your own life. Why do you do what you do? And so motive in missions or motivation in life, some questions you could ask yourself is what drives you? So that would be a motivational question. What drives you or what makes you tick? Or what keeps you going? Or what keeps you pressing forward? And I think God, above everything else, looks uh, at our heart and he looks at our innermost being and says, why are you doing what you're doing? And he wants uh, not just a, a, a relationship of, you know, of obedience, but a relationship of love. Uh, he loved, uh, he, we love him because he what first loved us. <coughs> and so that alone 
is biblical motivation and how we ought to love him because he first loved us. And so that should be the basis of our relationship with God is a motivation to love him because he first loved us. When I think of missions, I think of the motive. Why am I doing what I'm doing? And so there are two main motives in the Christian life that will keep us on track and fulfill God's will for our life. And I don't, I don't think we can just sit down and analyze our life and say, okay, I believe this is what, why I'm doing what I'm doing because we don't know our heart. Uh, it's deceitful. It's, the Bible says it's wicked. And it says we cannot know it. We cannot even have a true relationship with it to understand it. And that's why I believe the Word of God is so powerful because it's the Word of God that tells us who we are. You know, never tell yourself and believe what your, yourself or the devil is telling you about yourself. You always approach the bio, or you always approach God and yourself according to the scriptures. We say God is who he is according to the scriptures. Amen. We let the Bible define who God is. Amen. We let the Bible define who Jesus Christ is, but also we let the Bible define who we are. And that's when we're, we get on track. That's why we give out gospel tracts. And the first point is, hey, we're all sinners. The Bible's teaching us who we are and who we need. <clears throat> and so that's why it's so important that we go to the Word of God when it comes to the motive of our heart. Let's look at Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the Word of God is quick. That means it's uh, able to make alive it, and, and that it is alive. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2 uh, talks about how we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but he has what? Quickened us. He has made us alive. <coughs> and so this is the same word here. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and notice this, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So the word intents would be the root of intention. It's the word of God that will reveal your inner uh, uh, person and what your true intentions are. And that's what God is looking for. He wants that heart, that love relationship with us and that inner being to be connected with him and that we love him <clears throat> out of a true heart and that we love him out of an honest heart and that we love him out of a scriptural uh, love to him, a love for him. And so <clears throat> when I think of being motivated, I think we have to be motivated according to the scripture, not just saying, okay, this is what motivates me. This is why I get up and do what I do. This is why I get up and go to church. We all have a reason why we came to church th uh, this morning. And so what is that motive? And that's what I mean by going to the Word of God because the Word of God will reveal our inner motive and how often we go to the Scriptures in our daily walk with God and, and God pricks our heart and says, you need to make this right in your life. You need to correct this in your life. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's the Word of God uh, as a mirror where we see ourselves and see who we truly are and thereby make correction. Otherwise, we wouldn't really know who we are and what, what, what next step we are supposed to take in life. And so I believe two uh, key motivations are, first of all, there's a backwards look. And what do I mean by that? I mean the mercy of God where you look back at what God has done in your life and because of the mercy of God in your life you are then presently motivated to serve God right in the present but also in the future and so <coughs> being motivated by mercy and so we'll look at this point being motivated by mercy take your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 Ephesians 2, this is a passage I was just referring to. And you hath he quickened, 
verses 1 to 6, <coughs> who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, that means our way of living, uh, in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But notice verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. Amen. And so, being motivated by mercy, and that's what I refer to as a backwards look. You're looking back at the mercy of God in your life, <clears throat> and seeing what he has done for you and letting that motivate you. And we see that, that's a, that that is a scriptural motivation. Yes, there's that aspect of where Paul says uh, he does nothing but, you know, press forward and he doesn't look behind. <clears throat> but that's a different aspect where we're, where we're dealing with the past to move forward. <clears throat> but here we are looking at the past saying, look at the mercy of God in my life and letting that be a driving uh, force to motivate us to serve God. Um, I just thought of this here, Romans chapter uh, 12, I believe it is. Very powerful. Yes, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And so we know this passage. It's talking about that we present our bodies uh, a living sacrifice where he wants us to yield our body and yield it to him that he can do whatever he wants with it, that we're laying our life down as if uh, as a sacrifice and how he wants us to do it, holy and acceptable unto God, <coughs> which is your reasonable service. But notice, Paul is begging them to do this and he's doing it by what? He's saying, uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And that'll be a driving force, a motivation from which to serve God is saying, look what God has done for my life. And if you ever just sit down, uh, I know I do, I sit down and, uh, and uh, meditate on salvation and the day I got saved and then meditate on where I, I could have been uh, uh, if, if I had not been saved. Thank you. And uh, you just, uh, you dwell on, uh, I know it sounds weird, but you think about hell. Have you ever done that? Just think about it and just say, and, and tell yourself, it is real. It's a real place. And, and, and the Bible talks about it and, and to meditate on that and say, that's exactly where I would have gone if I had not been, uh, been saved. And that's exactly where the lost people are going and just meditating on the truth, even though it might not uh, be great to meditate on, but to think about where you truly would have been had you not been saved, and then think of the mercy of God, that he was merciful to you. He, he chose to be merciful to you. Uh, it's just so deep that uh, all you can, you can just speak on the surface. You can't speak the depth of the mercy of God in your life. And how, how powerful that is that he, he, he took away your sin. Uh, he doesn't remember them anymore. Uh, you're on your way to heaven, but he's left you here uh, for a purpose. Man, I remember before I got saved how, how empty life was. And, and I learned the routine very early in life. I was 14 years old. I wasn't allowed to go to high school. I uh, uh, had a full-time job when I was 14. I uh, drove from... Uh, uh, what was it, whatever, southern Ontario, close to the lakeshore, all the way to Kitchener, Waterloo, every single day, <laughs> an hour and a half one way, an hour and a half the other way, three hours of driving just to go to work, and, you know, I learned that cycle, that life cycle where it's just empty. You go to work, and you live for the weekend, you party it up, and back to work, and, and just misery, and, and vexation, and, and emptiness, <clears throat> and but what the day I got saved, how, how I was just filled with purpose that uh, I was now connected with the God who created me and who desired uh, to, to have me. And now I could serve him with all my heart. And so being motivated by mercy 
also we talked about John, uh, 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. These are scriptural motivations that we can uh, have in our life saying, God, I want to serve you with all my heart and I want to love you because you love me and I want to serve you because you are merciful to me. And, and that way we're, we're going to be on track serving God for the right reason. Not just doing the right thing, but doing the right thing for the right reason. Amen. Also, there's that the principle of forgiveness. You know, if you really look at the principle of forgiveness, uh, forgiving other people shouldn't be very hard. I mean, at the immediate, if you're offended and you, uh, you know, offenses will come and you are offended <coughs> and you are hurt, it's very hard. But if you look at the overall scope of, of forgiveness and what God has forgiven us, it should motivate you then to forgive other people. And so this is just another principle that we can look at in the scriptures as a right motivation. And we see that where that rich uh, gentle, or there was that one uh, servant who owed very much money and yet he was forgiven all his debts, yet he went to his servant and grabbed him by the throat and say, pay that thou owest. And he forgot of all the great debt that he was forgiven of, a picture of all the sin that God has forgiven us of and how that we need to now forgive others as he forgave us. Another principle of doing the right thing for the right reason and, and making it easy, so to speak, for us to forgive others when you think about that. And I think that's why God would have us sometimes just sit down Think about the day of our salvation and think of the mercy of God in our life and uh, of the great forgiveness in our life and let that be a driving force uh, to serve others. Like Israel, God wants us to remember our great exodus, the day we got delivered when we applied the blood. God wanted them to remember his great works until every succeeding generation. They were to hold a, f a feast called the Passover and it was in remembrance of that great day when they were delivered out of the hands of the Egyptians. And so God wants us to remember. We see that over and over and over, how that he wants us to remember. And Jesus, he did the same thing. He, uh, he, he break the bread and he gave them the drink and then he said, this do what? In remembrance of me. And how we need to be reminded of our, that great day of when we were saved, or in Israel's day, that great, day, that great Passover, when the death angel came and killed all the firstborn, yet saved Israel alive, and how they were supposed to remember that, <coughs> but they forgot God's work. Take your Bibles to Psalm 106, verses 7 to 13. Psalm 106, verse 7 to 13. Our fathers understood not thy works in Egypt. They remembered not, look at this, the multitude of thy mercies. That's the power of remembering what God has done in your life and the power of remembering the great mercies of God in your life and then let that be a driving force to serve God. But look what they forgot. <coughs> Our fathers understood not thy works, thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even at the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through the depths and through the wilderness. And he saved them from the hand of him that hated them, and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. And the waters covered their enemy. There was not one of them left. Then believed they his words. They sang his praise. But notice verse 13. They soon forgot his works. They waited not for his counsel. And so the great danger of forgetting the works of God in, in, in our life and not telling our children uh, why we are who we are and why we do what we do. And so <coughs> how powerful that is to 
to motivate ourselves, but also the next generation to serve God. <clears throat> and so that is the, the backwards look uh, and being motivated by the mercy of God. Uh, let's look at Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is Paul. I, I love uh, how Paul just, uh, wherever he is, is always given his testimony and referring back to it. And he speaks of his testimony a lot, of, uh, a lot in the scriptures of what God had done in his life. Verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, <clears throat> but look at this, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And so he noticed who he was, but then he noticed the mercy of God in his life. He's saying, but I obtained mercy and notice the context here this is paul writing to timothy and he's saying this is who i used to be but this is what god has done in my life and he's and he's looking back at his life and be and he's being motivated himself of course he's excited as he's writing this but also motivating timothy saying this is who i used to be but this is what god has done in my life and so you take what God has done in your life and you move forward with that. And he encouraged this young preacher uh, this way with his own testimony. And so how powerful that is that we look back at our life and look back at the day that we got saved and, and trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior and let that be a motivation to, you know, to get out there, to give out gospel tracts, to be a witness and, and to do what God has called us to do and to be faithful in that. <coughs> and so that's a backwards look. Next we have a forwards look, and that would be that to glorify God. You know, there's the mercy of God in our life saying, because of what God has done in my life, I want to serve Him. But also a forward look <coughs> in saying that I want to glorify my Heavenly Father uh, with, with my life. Our number one purpose in life is to live a life of faith to please and glorify our Heavenly Father. Take your Bibles to Revelation 4.11. Here we see a beautiful heavenly scene here. And at the end, we see them praising uh, God. And at the very end, we see part of their praise Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. We are here to serve God and to glorify Him. He's created us for His great pleasure. You think about God who uh, had His prized creation uh, in the Garden of Eden, yet they rebelled, and ever since that, God never just left them hanging. He has pursued mankind because he loved us and he created us for his pleasure and now it was broken. The connection was not there. He didn't have that pleasure of communicating and fellowshipping with mankind. And let that ring true in your ear that that's how much God loves you. You know, the devil would always have you think that nobody loves you and that God doesn't love you, but he loves you. And just think about that. I know we hear that, God loves you, but think about how God pursued you. I spoke of my testimony, how that, you know, uh, not knowing then, but looking back from the day I got saved about four or five months prior to that, how I could see the hand of God in my life where He was pursuing me. And I believe to, to a degree that that was His last <laughs> pursuit, so to speak. I don't know how to explain it, but how wicked my life was and uh, I wouldn't even want to even you know speak of those things uh, you know that I had done 
and the wickedness and the sin in my life and how God pursued me. Same thing he did with Adam and Eve. He didn't just leave them hanging. They went and made uh, clothes of, uh, to cover up their own sin, but yet God took an innocent animal and, and took that skin and clothed them in righteousness, so to speak. Same thing he has done uh, for us in the Lord Jesus Christ and how God has, ever since he has pursued mankind and how he wants, and you see how Jesus, when he glorified the Heavenly Father, and he says, look, all the ones you've given me, I have not let any of them go. And so it just, it's so precious to him to have one person saved and to have him in his fold and say, I'm not going to let you go. And how that was part of Jesus' ministry was that he was going to, um, uh, that as many as would trust in him, he would uh, save and keep them. And of course, uh, that's still going on today. It wasn't just his earthly ministry. <clears throat> but how God has created us and he's created us for his pleasure and that's why we are created. And then the Bible also says, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And so that would be very easy, you know, the next time you want to do something, say something, buy something, whatever the choices you have to make in life, ask yourself, is this going to please God? We're here to please our Heavenly Father. Is this going to please God? Is this going to glorify God? <clears throat> because that is our purpose. We are here to serve Him and to glorify Him. Take your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10. Oh, I just mentioned that, so we don't have to go there. But that is the passage, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Talking about in all contexts, in all uh, communication and whatever we do, is to glorify our Heavenly Father. Hebrews 11.6 <coughs> And this is in connection with <coughs> uh, Revelation 4.11 <coughs> because you always have to qualify, you know, we're here to uh, please God, but what, what does that really mean? Verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. And so to please God is a walk of faith, a life of faith, but without faith it is impossible to please Him. But we're here to please Him and to serve Him, but that's going to take a life of faith. And that's where we don't know what's behind the door, so to speak, yet we move forward and we serve God in faith, not knowing what's going to uh, take place. John 8, 29. Okay. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I... Do always those things that what? Please him. And so the Lord Jesus Christ had a life himself of where he was pleasing God and that was his purpose in life. At, and we'll close at that. But just being motivated to serve God and just two simple points. Looking back, a backwards look, the mercy of God and looking forward and that is to glorify our Heavenly Father. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and the power thereof. And, and uh, it's so powerful that really we don't know who we are apart from it and, and what to do apart from it. it. It's everything to us. It should be everything to us and help us to make uh, your word everything to us and, and, uh, and uh, to serve you faithfully by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Stay here for just a moment, brother. I have never heard anyone, I've been saved for 27 years or something, I lose track. Um, any, we always talk about forget about what's behind, forget about the filth, forget about the trash. I've never heard anyone express, look back to the mercy of God. Remember what God did for you the next time you're thinking in the flesh and living in the flesh and living for yourself. That was great. I stopped him a couple minutes early because I want to ask him a couple questions and I want to open it up for you to ask him a couple questions. Um, my question to you first, brother, um, is are you as naturally fluent in 
what we call the low German language as you are, say, comfortably preaching and teaching in English? You no, because so many years removed uh, okay. that I don't think in low German. I, understand. I think in English. And so, okay. yeah, I can't wait till we're immersed with those people where it's just going to be thinking in that language as well. Have you ever spoken in, in, in German like in a, in a church setting? Uh, no. Oh, okay. And so that's, and, and also that's another whole realm is uh, preaching is so much different from everyday language right. because the terminology is not there. So even those that are very fluent in low German, now to preach the word would be very different. Have you ever so, had to, have you ever been able to witness to them yet? Anyone personally like share the gospel? Oh yeah. So I've done a recording. Uh, okay. I'm d I, I, re I wrote a gospel track in low German okay and so they just got published and so I wrote this from scratch so you wrote uh, that track in, in low German yeah can, can you read part of it like out loud so we can hear it yeah yeah so os manchen sind wie immer nischierig und wollen Dinge weiten du sind Dinge wot wie kann weiten und Dinge wie dort wie kann nicht weiten ein Ding dort Gott will haben dort wie weiten sollen als dort wie weiten dort wie eiwirt leben haben the Bible sagt uns in 1. Johannes 5, 13, that we can invite and that we live and live and live. Anybody understand? Yeah, come on, Ray. I want to know what's yeah. going on. We don't do tongues without interpreting. Yeah. Tell me what this guy just said or I'm throwing him out. Come on. So, one more. I'll say the Not verse. Not you. I want to hear what. All right, read the verse and then we'll do this. Yeah. Okay. Det schrieb er kind, da ye on Gott sehen und sehen gleiben. Dot ye weiten, dot ye, dot ivy leven haben. All right, give me somebody that can do that. Tell me what he said. What he, let the women keep silence in church. No, what did he say? What did he say? Come on, Mom. Amen. Is that true? Can I get a second confirmation? Are you sure? I mean, I can raise my hand too and say, oh, yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, very good. That's fascinating. So, yeah, I can't yeah. wait to actually okay. preach. So, I, I do sit down and I preach like. You know, not to a crowd, but yeah, preach or to your like kids. This. Yeah. yeah, and so it's awesome. Yeah. And you know what? I understand that because I used to stand on the side of a mountain in in Ireland, and I would preach to the city, and I was all by myself. So I yeah. get it. I know what you're saying. <laughs> so all right. So um, and your plan is to start eventually st to start a church and, and yeah, to and reach so some people it's and, about church and, planting. Okay, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. We love. We believe in the local church. We believe in reaching yeah. uh, people groups, and that is. That is yeah. a powerful and amazing thought. I also wanted to ask you was, um, so you're going to go also to learn Spanish? Yeah, so it, we're going to be there. The plan is two years. It probably shouldn't take that long, but to be in the university there and to learn Spanish fluently, to do business, to get around, and then also to reach the, the immediate culture and also to learn the immediate culture. Excellent. Uh, not just the Mennonite culture. And even that is a big change. I've grown up in a lot of different Mennonite areas, and so the, even the Mennonite culture alone is a learning curve it's there. It's a subculture. Yeah. The old colonies even yeah. more different than yeah. that. Okay. So would, yeah. would you speculate that some of these people are actually saved where you're headed? Yes, there, there would be some. They just, they've never expressed it, never known how to express right. it, never even known that you maybe should express it. Uh, just so many things where... You know, all they heard was the gospel over the radio and did, did what they said okay. and out of their heart, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, but, uh, you know, never had anybody to share that with or so on. And so That's awesome. you'll find a lot of those uh, usually uh, married uh, um, like a couple, either just the husband or just the wife that has been saved for a long time, but didn't dare share with the husband or vice versa oh, that ha happens a lot so you're saying there'll be a few nicodemuses who come to jesus by night no one sees them no one knows yeah. about it but they come to jesus or, yeah. or um joseph of arimathea that's yeah. dramatic great content this morning see how different preachers are bud ring as loud as a chainsaw right and and, and brother john here as calm as <laughs> can be god needs all kinds god takes all kinds and here's a man and i do not mean this in a derogatory way whatsoever. Here's a man that told us he wasn't in school at 14 years old. I mean, at the time, very uneducated, but has gone through Bible school and ready to go reach people. That is a tremendous thing. That is tremendous. Mm -hmm. And so, does anyone have any questions they would like to, Emerna? Say it in English, please. <laughs> Are 
Um, my desire would be um, to more or less the old colony. And so I don't know if you're familiar with Tres Cruces area. So it's just a little south of uh, Chihuahua co colony. And then also there's the Brechas. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's um, the Mennonite settlement just under Santa Cruz City, uh, just southeast. And so that's where my heart is at. Of course, all, the, all of the people there, yeah. but especially the, the ones that are deeply religious and yeah, lost. Amen. My plan is to preach the low German, like their mother tongue. Because when we were in high school, those people said this so often. They were hearing, when I turned yep. around, they couldn't understand the word of yep. understand Exactly. The yeah. Word. Yeah. So my generation, generation older than us, uh, still hardly any understanding uh, of, the low, of the German language, even though they sing it and they preach out of it. It's. Uh, it's dead, and, the, and Satan has them trapped that way. Does anyone else have a question? Anyone else? We're going to close it up real quick, but I just want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask questions. Okay? Do you have more of those tracks? Yes. Okay, maybe we'll take I a think few. I have some All right, not right now, but yeah, that's well. super. All right. Okay, you know what? We've got a couple minutes. So let's stand and stretch, and let's get ready for the morning service, and we'll meet back and greet someone while you can. And also so, designed yeah. to. Okay. Um, delete this and put